Greetings, students. I'm going to pick up exactly where we left off last time, considering Rule 6, that two universal premises cannot have a particular conclusion, and that if a syllogism makes that mistake, it's called the existential fallacy. I also said to understand the philosophy behind that, we're going to need to do a little excursus into the epistemology of logic. Epistemology is a part of philosophy, so in doing epistemology we're doing philosophy of a particular type. And it's derived from uh, episteme and logos, right? Logos you know about. It's the logos of the episteme, or in modern terms, the theory of knowledge. And it's the branch of philosophy concerned with the nature and scope and limitations of knowledge, how knowledge is related to truth, belief, and justification, how knowledge is produced, and skepticism about different knowledge claims. Now this way of thinking about the syllogism is different from the way Aristotle thought about the syllogism. And the reason this view developed has to do with the work of George Boole, who was an English mathematician, logician, and philosopher who helped establish modern symbolic logic and whose algebra of logic, now called Boolean algebra, is basic to the design of digital computer circuits. If you take symbolic logic with me next semester, essentially you're going to learn a system like this, like the one that Boole developed. Now, one of George Boole's key insights was to think of logic in terms of what we today call the algebra of sets that we went over in an earlier lecture. And when he began to think about Aristotle's account of logical relationships from this perspective, he discovered something that at first doesn't sound very earth-shattering, that Aristotle's square assumes that the subject term of categorical propositions refers to actually existing things. That if I make the claim all S or P, it seems to imply that some S or P, and remember some in logic means that there exists at least one. Or if I say no S or P, it seems to imply that there's some S that exists that's not a P. And this seems to make sense, right? Suppose I claim all dogs are mammals. That would seem to imply that some dogs are mammals, right? that at least one dog exists. That's a mammal. But think about this one. All dragons are fearsome creatures. Does that imply that some dragons are fearsome creatures? Because remember, some is an existence claim. There exists at least one or more. Right? And this gives us what Boole thought of as the assumption of existential import, or the existential viewpoint. And a proposition has existential import if it presupposes or assumes the object it refers to actually exists. And what Bull realized was logic would work just fine if we dropped this assumption of existential import. And more than that, that would, it would open up a way of thinking about various very important things for what he called the hypothetical viewpoint. right? And he realized that this would change many of the traditional laws of logic and do so in a way that made them more useful in, in how we use language in an ordinary sense and especially in how we do science. So Boole developed a new system of categorical logic without the assumption of existential import for A and E propositions. And this new logic would employ what is called the hypothetical viewpoint as, exposed, as opposed to the existential uh, viewpoint. And this helps us think about the language we use when we talk in science. Right? In modern mathematical physics, there are many universal statements used that lack existential import. Galileo, for example, in developing his account of acceleration in a gravity field, made universal claims about bodies moving on frictionless planes. But no such thing could ever exist, a perfectly frictionless plane. Or we could talk about a perfect sample of something, but we would never have a perfect sample of it. Einstein also proposed claims about what, what would happen to everything that moved at the speed of light and so forth. But these are things, again, that cannot exist. So Galileo's and Einstein's insights are based on arguments that lack 
existential import simply is stated, yet they seem to somehow function and end up telling us something important about how the world actually works. Or consider some more mundane examples. Suppose I said, all students who receive three unexcused absences will fail my course. Now, I am not assuming those students actually exist, that there are students uh, who will do this. I'm very hopeful, you see. Uh, or suppose I said no late assignments will be accepted for credit. I'm not assuming that there will actually be late assignments. Now, there might be or there might not, but in my statement, no late assignments will be accepted for credit. It doesn't mean I'm claiming there will, will be late ex ex assignments and I won't accept them for credit. Again, so hopeful am I. Now, clearly in everyday life, as well as in modern science, we make A and E claims all the time without existential import. And that seems to work and to tell us something important about how we think and move in the world. Now, also note that Aristotle, Boole, and everyone else are all in agreement that I and O propositions do have existential import. I, everyone agrees that I and O could never be true unless they referred to actually existing things. The key point here is the status of A and E propositions. And secondly, a proposition with existential import cannot be true unless its subject term refers to one or more things that actually exist. So a proposition lacks existential import when its subject term does not refer to anything that exists. We then say that the subject class names an empty class or an empty set. The category names does not include any actually existing things. So if I claimed all Charmanders are powerful creatures, that doesn't mean Charmanders actually exist, right? Sadly. But if I claim some rhino beetles are pets, well, that is true because, or false, right? <laughs> because rhino beetles actually exist. And in fact, I had a student who had a rhino beetle as a pet. He would bring it to class sitting on his shoulder to the amazement of all of us. So the claim that some rhino beetles are pets is true. And it has existential import. So when we interpret a categorical proposition presupposing that its subject term actually exists, we are said to be taking the existential viewpoint. And if we do not presuppose this, we are said to be taking the hypothetical viewpoint. And the key to understanding Bull's insight is really quite simple. He saw that we can understand A and E propositions as really being conditional statements. What all SRP really means is, if something is an S, then it's a P. And what no SRP really means is, if something is an S, then it's not a P. Now this helps us make sense of many things. If you heard me say, all Jedi Knights are champions of justice, like the great Qui-Gon Jinn there, what I would mean by that is, if Jedi Knights actually existed, and I'm not claiming that they do, then every one of them would be a champion of justice. Or suppose I said, no dragons are creatures fond of thieves, like Smaug here. Hmm? Well, what I would really be saying is, if dragons actually existed, and I'm not claiming that they do, then they would not be fond of thieves. Or suppose I said, all trespassers are persons who will be prosecuted. What I'm really saying is, if there are trespassers, then they will be prosecuted, not persecuted. <laughs> they should be prosecuted. And if I said no cheating students are persons who will pass my class, I don't mean to claim that there is a cheating person, but simply that if there are cheating students, then they will not pass my class. But I do sometimes wish I could make things exist just by claiming they do. That would be a fine thing, I think. If I could make that claim, all Jedi are Force-sensitive beings, and one would exist, like the great Master Yoda. So let's consider Rule 6 again now. Let's get back to just applying the rule. Two universal premises cannot have a particular conclusion. Suppose I argued, 
All persons who believe in the possibility of extraterrestrial visitation are persons who believe in the possibility of life on extrasolar planets. And all persons taking aboard alien starships are persons who believe in the possibility of alien visitation. So, some persons taking aboard alien starships are persons who believe in the possibility of life on extrasolar planets. So, it's much easier if we put it into symbols. This has the form all M or P, all S or M, some S or P. And it immediately jumps out at you that you have two universal premises and a particular conclusion. Now, if we adopt the hypothetical viewpoint, this is invalid. Would there be a case where we could assume the existential viewpoint for a universal proposition? Well, that would only occur if we knew that the things that it's, it's referring to actually exist, right? So if we consider the premises without presupposing that persons taking aboard alien starships actually exist, it's clearly invalid. However, if we could assume the existence of such persons, say in some future time when this is a verifiable occurrence, we would be entitled to accept the claim and would then be operating under what is called the existential viewpoint. And we'd put a little asterisk by it and say, valid under the existential viewpoint if we knew that such things existed. Consider an example of how this actually occurred, where <laughs> a universal statement went from being invalid under the hypothetical viewpoint to being valid under the existential viewpoint. Now, before the late 19th century, humans did not have evidence that other galaxies existed. Before the 19th century, people thought the entire universe was our Milky Way galaxy, uh, except for Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher who thought there might be other galaxies, but he had no way to prove it. Now, someone making uh, the argument that we're going to consider in a minute before Edwin Hubble discovered Cepheid variables and their significance in 1925 would have been arguing under the hypothetical viewpoint and would have no way to take the existential one. But now we can adopt the existential viewpoint, which gives us a different result since 1924, right? Uh, surely you know this, but if you don't, here's a little review for this, ep um, this important discovery. Hubble looked for Cepheid variable stars in the closest of the spiral nebula, the Andromeda Nebula, and he found it over 2 million light years away, and so must be at least 200,000 light years in diameter, and so it can't be part of the Milky Way. So consider the following argument. Premise 1. All systems of space containing less than a billion stars are objects receding from the Earth at a rate proportional to its distance from the Earth. Premise 2. All small galaxies are systems of space containing less than a billion stars. Conclusion. Some small galaxies are objects receding from the Earth at a rate proportional to its distance from the Earth. And here's our local, it's called our local cluster. You have all these a cluster of galaxies, right? clusters of galaxies. Now before 1925, this argument could only have been hypothetical and one could not have concluded that different galaxies exist or were receding from us and so forth. One would only have had an hypothesis. But given what we know now, we can evaluate it from the existential viewpoint and accept it as valid, with a little asterisk saying, under the existential viewpoint, given what we know now. So when evaluating such arguments, you, you should indicate under what viewpoint you are viewing it, right? If you claim it's invalid, you'd say under the hypothetical viewpoint, I find this to be invalid. Right? But if it concerns something we know exists, you can say valid under the existential viewpoint. So here we have a summary of our rules. Right? Don't forget the pretest, though. Before you even apply the rules, you have to apply the pretest, which that uh, it has to consist of three premises that are stand in standard form, and that they must also can only contain three terms that have uh, no equivocal meanings, right? that they mean the same uh, throughout the argument. So rule one, the middle term must be distributed in at least one premise. 
Rule 2, if a term is distributed in the conclusion, then it must be distributed in the premise. Rule 3, a categorical syllogism cannot have two negative premises. Rule 4, a negative premise must have a negative conclusion. Rule 5, a negative conclusion must have a negative premise. And Rule 6, two universal premises cannot have a particular conclusion. Now remember, you also need to know the form of the four figures, right? Because, uh, say, if I ask you to evaluate an AAA1, you have to be able to know where the middle terms go to reconstruct what that means. So consider this sample exercise. You will almost certainly have something like this on your exam at the end of the course. And I say, using the pretest and the six rules, discuss why the following syllogistic forms are valid. It would probably help you to write out the form in question before evaluating it. So I'm asking you to evaluate an AAA1. So you want to lay out its universal form, all M or P, all S or M, all S or P, and then you sort of run it through the checklist, pretest. Well, there are only three terms and everything is in standard form. Rule one, the middle term is distributed in the first premise, so no problem there. Rule two, the minor term is distributed in the conclusion, but it's also distributed in the second premise. And since the major term is not distributed in the conclusion, it does not need to be distributed in the major premise. So it passes rule two. It passes rule three because there are no negative premises. It passes rule four because there are no negative premises. It passes rule five because the conclusion is not negative, and it passes rule six because the conclusion is not particular. And finally, here's the heart of the matter, why we've studied all this. It's when you find an argument out in the wild and you want to evaluate it through Aristotle's system of logic. Right? So here I tell you to translate a given argument into standard form, name its mood and figure, use the pretest and the six rules to determine if it's valid or not, and if it's invalid, state the fallacy it commits. Right? So here's the argument we found in the wild. Since all libertarians are believers in personal liberty, and all persons who defend protection from unreasonable search and seizure are believers in personal liberty, it follows that all persons who defend protection from unreasonable search and seizure, seizure are libertarians. And so here's the model answer. We put it into standard form. All libertarians are believers in personal liberty. All persons who defend protection from unreasonable search and seizure are believers in personal liberty. Therefore, all persons who defend protection from unreasonable search and seizure are libertarians. And now to make it much easier to deal with, we put it into universal form and we circle the distributed premises. And when we do that, we see immediately both middle terms are undistributed. Now this is an AA2, and it's invalid, so it breaks rule one. And then you explain how it breaks rule one. The middle term, believers in personal liberty, is not distributed in at least one premise. And so this gives us the fallacy of the undistributed middle. Now, you might also want to construct an instance of a valid argument, right? Suppose you know that an AAA1 is valid. Well, uh, I could ask you on an exam, make up a syllogism that has the form of an AAA1 and is valid. This would be a good way to find out if you really understand what's going on with these things. And so first you're going to need to get the form right so you can play with it. And the form of an AA1 is all M or P, all S or M, all S or P. When you're trying to think of a syllogism and having fun with it, just think of something cool you'd like to show as valid, right? Uh, that you'd like to show as true, and you want to give a valid argument for it. See there, I almost made a mistake. I almost called the conclusion valid, but remember a conclusion can be neither valid or invalid, but only true or false. Even I sometimes slip up. Okay. So, I might want to claim that all true Star Wars fans are persons of discerning aesthetic sensibilities. Right. So I've got my subject term, 
and I've got my predicate term right there. So I could plug those in. I could plug in my subject and the minor. All true Star Wars fans are. And I could plug in my predicate term. All blank or persons of discerning aesthetic sensibilities. And then I could think of something to put in there that makes sense. And I thought of persons who recognize great works of art. Because clearly, Star Wars is a great work of art. It really ought to be showing all the time in the Louvre and in every other great museum of art where great artistic achievements are displayed. Right? So it's fun to try to think of valid syllogisms and it allows me to see if you really understand what the heck is going on. So that's the heart of the matter. That's what we've been aiming at. How to evaluate arguments using Aristotle's system. And also along the way, finding a way to just think about thinking and get clearer on that in our minds. I'll have one more little lecture for you to finish up. So I look forward to talking with you one more time uh, soon. <laughs> Thank you for your kind attention.